I'll either run out of slides or... <laughs> no problem. Oh, you okay? Thanks. Um, so I'm sure everyone's here because they think I'm going to sing like ACDC because of the tri uh, uh, title of the presentation. But unfortunately, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about building clouds, um, specifically small clouds. Um, so at my house, I have a lot of home servers, uh, like a mail server, IRC server, that kind of stuff. And I thought it would be a great idea if I had a cloud at home to virtualize all of that infrastructure. Um, you know, everyone talks about moving to the cloud. I didn't want to run my servers on an external cloud. I wanted it on a local cloud. And when I was in college, I was also a system administrator. So I thought as a developer on the OpenStack project, it would be a very interesting exercise to see how it would work as a small, independent, single user trying to use the software I help develop every day. So the scope of the project was to be, pretend to be a system administrator without any OpenStack knowledge um, going into the project. I would rely solely on installation documentation and Google searches, like everyone does when they're trying to figure out something on a computer, um, to install OpenStack on, on something at my house. I set a hardware budget of 1,500 US dollars which is a sentimental value for me because that's how much money I spent on my first desktop computer with my bar mitzvah money many, many years ago. Um, and I was only going to concentrate on building a basic compute cloud. Um, basically, I just wanted the infrastructure so that I could boot up a VM and shut it down with networking um, on, my, on my home network um, with an API. Um, at the time of the project, I was going to install the Okada release of OpenStack, which is from April 2017. Um, that was the latest version of OpenStack when I was doing this project. It is now uh, the Queen's release, I think. It's, they do a release every six months of OpenStack, so it's, the version's a bit out of date. Um, and I would not rely on any pre-existing installation scripts or automation. There are lots of projects out there to help automate an installation of OpenStack. I was not going to rely on any of that because part of the exercise was um, to do it by hand. And one thing that goes against my theory, my thought exercise of pretending to be a system administrator is I decided to install, install from the release tarballs. So just the source code that the OpenStack project pushes out and says this is our release. Um, I did this primarily as an OpenStack developer. I wanted to see, as someone working on the project, how hard it would be to take just the source code we release and turn it into something working, which was actually very um, interesting for me. So the first thing I needed when building a cloud was hardware. Um, and I needed criteria with which to buy hardware because $1,500 is not a lot of money to buy servers. Um, so my first priority was core count per US dollar. Um, for a cloud to be useful, you want a lot of capacity. The most expensive thing for capacity is going to be the number of CPU cores you have. My second priority was RAM per core. Um, the more RAM I have, the more virtual servers I can have. I can overcommit servers um, with virtualization if I need to, as long as they're not loaded down, but RAM becomes a limiting resource. Um, the machines don't need to be fast, though, because that costs money, and that's something I can't afford. So I started looking at what was out there. Um, a very popular thing for home clouds is to use the Intel NUX. Uh, I think it's the next unit computer or something. They're little, little boxes with laptop processors in them that are a few hundred dollars. The problem with that is they're laptop processors. So they have two or four cores, which would not have enough core count for what I was looking for. Some people use Raspberry Pis, the same problem. They're four cores. They're also really RAM limited. Um, I also looked at new servers you know, from my employer or someone else, some other company that sells servers. And that would have blown my budget on a single server if I could even find one that cheap. So my solution was to go with eBay. Um, for those who don't know, eBay is you know, the, cloud, uh, the web auction site. It's very famous. But 
what a lot of people don't realize is when there are data centers that are upgrading their hardware, there are companies out there that buy that used hardware, refurbish them, um, and put them up for sale on eBay or on their own website, and you can get things really, really cheap, um, especially from almost a decade ago, which is what I bought. After searching on eBay and graphing all of my options, I found these Dell Power Edge R610s, which are from eight or nine years ago, that were $215 each. They have two quad-core Xeons in them, so eight physical cores and 16 virtual cores, which is a lot of capacity. They had 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, you know, they also said they came with two 10K SAS hard drives and you know, a lot of NICs. But it was $215, which was great. So I bought five. This was the day they were delivered to my apartment. Um, they came in these giant boxes. The FedEx guy just left them outside my apartment door in the rain. So then all of my neighbors came and stared at these giant boxes blocking my doorway as I'm walking, running in and out of the rain trying to get them in before they get damaged. Um, but then I had a problem. I've got five rack mount servers. Where am I gonna put them? They take up a lot of space. Um, I started looking at commercial racking solutions, even used ones on eBay as well, and that would have been, you know, $100 or so. And after buying, you know, $200 each, five of them, that's $1,000, shipping was pretty expensive. I think it ended up being like $1,100 or $1,200. I didn't want to spend $100 to $200 on a used rack um, because that would not have given me enough wiggle room in my budget in case something else came up. So I ended up going with something called the lack rack. I'm not sure who's familiar with this, but this is an IKEA side table that has a 19 inch width between the legs, which is exa the exact width of a rack mount server. So it was a perfect fit. I didn't come up with this idea. Someone in the Netherlands did. It's a great idea. The table is $9 or $10, um, and it comes in a ton of different colors. So, you know, how many, how many racks that you can buy off the shelf from <laughs> made out of metal come in different colors? So I racked my servers, and I bought a yellow one because Yellow's cool. Um, and then I also bought some casters um, and put them on the bottom uh, to push the servers around. Uh, turns out those casters cost two or three times as much as the rack did, which was um, an interesting thing. Um, and then I found a place for them in my, in my bedroom closet, uh, my data closet. And I wired everything up, and I was able to power things up and start inspecting the servers. Um, and, you know, I don't know how many people have bought things on eBay, especially used hardware, but it's never what you get. It's never what they describe. Um, so these servers, after I was able to power them on and start looking at them, they're super stripped down. Um, the, there is no management interface card for IPMI or remote control of the servers. This was a standard feature from Dell on all of these servers, but they take them out and charge $30 for it you know, to maximize their profit margin. But it didn't come with this. They also took out the redundant power supply that came out of the factory from Dell with two power supplies for redundancy. They just took one out because you don't need the redundancy and they can charge you an extra $30 for the redundant power supply. Um, they also said I was going to get four, uh, I, they said I was going to get eight four gig sticks of RAM. I ended up getting four eight gig sticks of RAM, which was an advantage for me. But the memory was installed in the wrong slots on half of the servers, so the dual channel configuration wasn't right and things weren't booting properly, so I had to fix that. Um, one of the servers came with a dead RAID controller battery, which just means that the little light on the front is orange every time I boot it, and since I'm not using RAID, it doesn't matter. Um, the other advantage for me was that it came with 15K SAS drives instead of 10K SAS drives, which you know gives me a little bit of a performance boost um, for the penalty of noise, but that was just something that was different from the specs. My favorite quirk with the servers was they came pre-installed with Windows Server 2012 with the password Apple123. So someone at this company has a little sense of humor. I don't know why they didn't put like Linux or something to test the hardware and they used Windows, but whatever. So after I got the hardware set up and I did a base Ubuntu install on the servers, it was time to install OpenStack on these servers to figure out how to build the cloud, how to deploy it. And Coming at it with no experience, it can be a bit daunting. You go to the official Git repos for OpenStack, there are 1,800 Git repos in the OpenStack, for the OpenStack project. You go to the government's documentation, there are over 50 project teams. It's not super straightforward to figure out just by looking at the project at you know, the source level or the developer level or even the governance level, how everything comes together. And all I wanted to do was build you know, a small cloud that can boot VMs and I can log into them and then I can do things on it. Um, 
But it turns out that there is something called the Compute Starter Kit, which is documented on the foundation marketing website for the project. Um, and you only need four projects out of those 1,800 Git repos to do what I wanted to do. Um, these four projects are Keystone, Glance, Nova, and Neutron. Keystone is used for identity management, so user management, authentication, and also maintaining a catalog of all the services running in your cloud. Glance is used for image management, so VM images um, that are used to boot servers. It keeps track of those. Nova is the service that actually boots the VMs and manages the VM lifecycle. And Neutron handles network provisioning. Um, and with these four projects, um, I would have the base set of functionality that I was looking for in my cloud. And it also turns out, if I didn't even think about this problem and just read the install guide blindly, that these are the main projects that the install guide is concerned with anyway. So it wasn't that much of a big deal. But so it's confusing for a lot of people, especially if you have no prior knowledge of OpenStack. So with that, and after reading the install guide, I decided on how I was going to install the different services in OpenStack on my hardware. So I have five servers, and I decided to name them AutoCumulus because I have OCD and think clouds should be named after clouds, and AutoCumulus is a type of cloud. Um, and I decided to do four dedicated compute nodes, so four nodes that were dedicated to just running VMs, and those are the AutoCumulus 2 through 5. Um, those servers just run the Nova Compute service to manage the VMs locally on the machine. And then the Neutron Linux Bridge agent, which is a daemon that uh, uh, manages the Linux Bridge configuration for controlling the networking to those VMs. Um, and then I was going to set up a controller node, but also have a compute node on it because I have limited hardware. So this is all in one node. So I have all of the API servers running on there as long as the database and the message queue. But then I also am running a Nova Compute and a Neutron Linux Bridge agent on it so that I can leverage the hardware on this one node as well for real workloads and running VMs. Um, and I thought this was a good balance based on my limited hardware and the limited load I was going to have on this cloud. If I was doing more work, more, more dynamic work with more than one user, I would not recommend this configuration because the database and the message queue will get load down, uh, loaded down with a lot of extra traffic. And then I started following the install guide, going through the services. It starts with Keystone, then goes to Glance, Nova, and Neutron, you know, to set up the work, set up all the base services, and then all the daemons. Um, but I hit a snag because I was installing from tarballs. Um, in the install guide, it says apt get install Keystone. Well, I wasn't using uh, the Ubuntu packages for OpenStack, so I couldn't do that. So I looked everywhere. I Google searched, how do you install OpenStack from Tarball? How do you install OpenStack from source? Turns out there's no documentation in basically anywhere. Um, so I failed um, in my thought exercise to try to do it as a system administrator with no prior knowledge. And I put that aside, and I, I have done this before. So I documented the steps you need to do to install from source, which is you download the Tarball, then you have to create a service user for the daemon to run as. You have to install the binary requirements for the Python. So OpenStack is a Python project. Some of the Python libraries it uses have C requirements or other language requirements that the Python links to. Um, and you need to install those. And the problem with that is a lot of projects don't actually document this. So when you do pip install to install the Python code, you'll get an error saying, oh, it can't find you know, this library file. So then you have to look up the library file and it, install the package and then start it all over again. So if you can find the list of binary requirements beforehand, that's helpful. But oftentimes, it's trial and error. Um, then the other thing you have to do is you have to create all of the state directories and configuration directories on the machine. So the, um, you know, like your nova.conf, your neutron.conf, all of the configuration files, you have to create directories and Etsy for that and then also state directories in varlib. Um, and then inside the tarball, there are sample configurations and default configurations that you need to copy into those created configuration directories. Um, this is because the Python packaging ecosystem doesn't actually provide a way to install anything besides the Python code where Python code is supposed to live. So if you say, OK, install the Nova package for me with uh, pip, which is the Python installer command, 
um, it will just install the Python code to where Python code lives and completely ignore all of the sample configuration or any other data files that you want. Um, so you have to do that manually from the tarball. After you do all of that, then you can pip install the tarball and continue following the install guide. Um, if this doesn't make it clear, um, use a distro package. <laughs> um, all of these steps are the exact role that distro packages serve. Um, you don't have to be a masochist and do what I did and go through all of the, the exercises when a distro package works just as well and there's nothing to like, actually compile or hand tweak. It's just, it's just Python code, so it's just a text file. Um, but after going through all of this, I started with the Keystone project and I did pip install and I started Keystone and I hit my first issue, which is another issue with the Python, um, Python installer um, and managing Python projects, um, which was a requirements issue. So I did pip install Keystone and it ran and then I started the service and then I got a runtime version conflict saying that one of Keystone's dependent libraries um, was using a version that was incompatible with what, I had, what pip had installed for me. I had not installed this package manually. I said pip install keystone, and it installed you know, its dependencies, its dependencies, dependencies, and so on and so forth. But it turns out that pip does not have a dependency solver. So it just goes in order of each project's requirements files, and whatever ends up being installed last for a version, if there's a shared requirement, is the one that's installed. And by doing this on Keystone, it installed itself in an incompatible state and the service wouldn't run. Um, when I saw this, I remembered that there's uh, something called uh, pip constraints, uh, which is something that we developed in OpenStack and pushed upstream to the pip project to maintain a single version that you install. So you say pip install with a constraints file and it lists a specific version for each package um, that's known working. So you basically bypass the dependency solver by doing it out of band manually so you know there's a known working version for each project. Um, and after reinstalling using that, I was able to get past this and start the Keystone service. And then we got to networking. I continued going along through the install guide, you know, hitting maybe little mistakes here or there that I made, but simple enough to fix. Um, but then it came time to set up Neutron, the networking service. And I was a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> Reading the install guides, it's asking me all of these questions. Do you want to use self-service networkers? Do you want to use provider networking? And I had no idea. <laughs> I started reading, you know, the networking guide. There's a separate documentation, there's a separate document about how you do networking. And I read through all of this. And then I found this diagram, which is for the Linux Bridge provider networks, and that's straight from the networking guide. And it explains the topology in my head that I thought I wanted for my cloud. I have everything on a flat uh, L2 switch network with a single unmanaged switch on my home network, which is a pretty common home networking setup, I think. Um, and all I wanted was on the compute nodes for the guests to come up, have an interface on a bridge interface that's connected to my physical network. And looking at this diagram, this is exactly what I wanted. You know, there's a physical network, just you know, one layer two, and everything connects to it and it all be up on the same network. So from my desktop, I could SSH in very easily. Everything would work. Um, the problem with that is it's all on a single L2, which means there's a shared broadcast domain. So when I have my home router with its own DHCP server, if you go back, there's all of this stuff on the right with DHCP. Neutron has its own DHCP because it assumes it's on its own isolated network. So when I set this up, my DHCP server on my router was getting lease requests from the VMs when they would boot up. And um, also Neutron would see that. And luckily, um, the default firewall rules for the VMs on Neutron would um, block the incoming reply from my DHCP server and would only get it from Neutron. But if I ever changed the firewall rules, then there would be a race condition between the DHCP servers, which would be no good. Um, and I also was getting you know, log files in my DHCP server and it was very messy. So I decided, okay, let's see if I can, I'll just turn off the DHCP. And also because 
there's no DHCP, I can't use the metadata service because uh, for those who are familiar with AWS, they know there's a, um, a metadata server that when a guest comes up, it can pull that and it will get metadata back about how the guest is set up. Uh, it's run on a static IP. I think it's like, is it on the previous slide? No, it's um, like 169 something. It's you know a hard-coded IP for a metadata service. And because of that, when the DHCP agent is running in Neutron, it will set that static route so that VMs can ping that. But if I'm not running DHCP, I can't use that. So I had to turn that off and DHCP off. And then I ended up basically with this diagram, which is the same thing, but without any of the DHCP. And all of my computers are on the, the physical network along with my router. And then the internet's exploding because it's the internet. Uh, um, so with that, I think I, I thought I had gotten the network settled. And I was ready to move on. But then I hit this issue. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can read this, but this is what happened when I started Neutron after figuring all of that out. Um, for those who can't read it because the text is probably pretty small, it says the error message, it's a big stack trace in Python, and then the error message is unserializable message, error, value error, IO operation on closed file. And that's all it said. I have no clue what this meant. It's no real indication of what was going on. It turns out, this is how Neutron tells you that the um, uh, net namespace command is not installed on your computer. And this is it saying net namespace not found. It took me about two hours to trace through the code and figure out what was going on to find that. Um, the way Neutron does privileged operations is it runs a separate daemon and there's a socket interface. And it sends the command it wants over the socket interface that's running as root. And that command, that separate process will run the command as root and then return the result. Um, except when it sent the command to do net namespace something and the command wasn't found, it just closed, it just closed the socket. And that was what this error was. But there was no indication of that. So I had to actually trace through the code and figure out what was going on to figure out I was missing the command, um, which goes back to the previous slide with binary requirements and not always being so obvious um, at install time <laughs> what is required. But after tracing through that and figuring it out, I was ready to boot my first guest. And I got this. Um, I said, you know, OpenStack server create with all of my parameters to boot it from an image. And nothing happened. Well, it said it was creating the server, but it just sat there not doing anything. And I was, you know, at a loss. So I started tracing through all of the logs. And Nova said, yeah, it's booting the logs and going through you know, the normal process of booting, getting the image, starting it up with libvert. Um, the only indication I could find of anything being wrong was this, which was a debug error, was a debug message, not a warning message, not a log message, which just said, wrote zero bytes to that image file with that checksum, which just means it's empty, um, which was definitely not right because I had uploaded an image to test you know, to boot. It was, you know, it was a Cirrus image, so it was like 20 megabytes. Um, so it should, you know, it should boot. There should be something there. But this was the only indication I got. What I ended up having to do was trace through the glance code and add print statements and log statements to indicate, you know, where the, where the, pat where the data was going through the file or going through the code. And I found out that it was outside of the glance code. So I had to figure out which library was wrong and install a new version. And after correcting the requirements issue, it ended up working. And after getting that, the guest booted. But then I still wasn't able to log in. I could see the console log and see the server booting, but I couldn't log in. I couldn't SSH into the guest. Um, and this comes back to the metadata service I was talking about before. It turns out the version of CloudInit at the time I was doing this doesn't understand static network configuration. Um, it, it expects either DHCP or a metadata service. Um, because that didn't work, because I turned off the DHCP server so I couldn't set the route to that IP, it was never getting any IP address. So it was trying to DHCP, but it wasn't getting a response because that was blocked. So it would just sit there. Um, what I ended up having to do was create all of my images using something called Glean, which is an alternative to CloudInit to manage the initial settings from a cloud um, when the guest is booted. So I would have to manually create the guests, the guest images for each server type that I wanted to boot, um, which is not an ideal solution, but it at least worked for me. Um, this has since been fixed. Um, 
this was actually fixed upstream in CloudInit when I originally did this project, but it had not rolled out to like the Fedora cloud image you would download or the Ubuntu cloud image, though it had not pulled in the newer version. The newer versions of the cloud images now use CloudInit greater or equal to 7.9, um, so you won't have this problem. Um, but if you do, you can always use Glean or another project to create, create your images if you're hitting this issue. Um, so just to kind of come full circle, um, the biggest pain points with doing an install like this for me was Python packaging. Um, almost all of the issues I hit were because I was using pip from tarballs, and it doesn't manage requirement. It doesn't manage, it doesn't have a dependency solver. It doesn't manage any data files or configuration. It doesn't understand any requirements outside of Python code. That makes it very difficult to install any of this stuff from source for any Python project, not just OpenStack. Um, and the other thing is that OpenStack is a complex system of software that's doing a lot of things under the covers. So debugging requires a certain level of knowledge about what's going on under the covers. You need to know a little bit about libvirt, a little bit about networking, or in this case, a lot about networking, um, to get everything working. But it's honestly not that bad. 90% of the issues were caused because I did tarballs instead of distro packages. The only real issue is networking the neutron. So it's not that hard if you want to do this yourself. We could improve our logging and the project and error reporting, but it's really not that bad compared to some other software I've deployed on a similar scale. Um, so just to come full circle, because I'm almost out of time, I had a bit of a crisis. What am I going to do with this cloud? I just spent $1,500 and all this time. Now what am I going to do with it? Um, so I came up with two examples, um, which is the only thing I could think of to do it, is um, OpenStack development. Having an OpenStack cloud locally is very useful for developing applications on top of OpenStack. Having a low latency API you can hit to write applications with is incredibly useful. And you also don't have to pay for the usage too much. Um, so it's not, it's very good for developing. And then the other thing I found is something I'm calling cloud native compute workloads, which are embarrassingly parallel tasks where you can just spin up, you know, I have 80 virtual CPUs. If I can use those all in parallel where they don't need to talk to each other for some kind of task, it's pretty good. The individual cores are slow, but there's a fair amount of parallel capacity I can do a lot. In my case, I used um, this application I wrote to do some transcoding. I do a lot of transcoding at home. But I'm not going to go into too much detail on why, but so that's what I was using it for. But then there are a lot of reasons you don't want to do this. Um, the first is five one u servers in your bedroom closet is not a pleasant experience. They're loud, they're really hot. I mean, like I can't sleep at night if these are running and I'm in my bed. Uh, also, the power bill is kind of ridiculous. At peak draw, they're drawing 1.35 kilowatts to one and a half kilowatts, so it's not that pleasant. And at the end of the day, I just wasted $1,300. I could have spent that on a weekend vacation somewhere nice. Um, so with that, I have some links for some extra information, including a blog post which goes into all of the details um, and a link to these slides if you're interested. And I think I'm out of time, so thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, that was a great talk. If, we have, if you have any questions, please look forward. I think that you'll be roaming around yeah. this space for the entire day. <laughs> yeah, so shall we have the next go up?